Okay, welcome back, everyone. It's uh, week one, day five of Web Fundamentals. We'll go ahead and uh, open up our lecture material for JavaScript Basics. Now, before JavaScript Basics was required, all of JavaScript would have been taught on this day. So what we're going to go over today is everything we learned in JavaScript uh, in, sorry, programming basics, um, a little bit more. Plus I want to go into Monday's lecture. Uh, Monday's lecture, as you can see, is DOM manipulation, but there's so much DOM manipulation that I want to do some today and then go over the rest of it Monday morning. So, here we are. I won't talk too much about JavaScript uh, other than what it can help us now do. So, so far we've been building squares and placing text and separating text by divs on a page. Now, we're going to be able to attach JavaScript to our HTML and CSS and make that JavaScript make the page responsive. Okay. Now with JavaScript, we can remove stuff off our page. We can add likes to a page. We can do lots of things. We can change the color, anything. Okay, so let's read this. Up until now, we've been making websites using HTML and CSS. And while we can make websites that look impressive and contain all the information that we want them to say, um, they will need something more to be truly interactive and to be functional. This is what JavaScript was uh, purpose. Uh, this is what JavaScript was purpose built to do. It allows us to write the logic and to add functionality that make our websites interactive for our users. JavaScript is very good at selecting the parts of the website we want to modify and attach events that listen for user input and manipulate the DOM, the document object model, the DOM. So now when we refer to our page, we're going to refer to it as the DOM, the document object model. So the document here is just the HTML document. That's what it means. That HTML file that you create, that's, that's called index.html, that's the document. The object model is referring to the different objects on the document. You have the head, you have the body. Within the body, you have containers, you have different divs. So that model of different objects on that document altogether is called the DOM. So when I right click this page, for example, and I see all this information on this says here, doc, doc type, this doc, this whole document is the document object model. Different things that I highlight over that highlight different squares. I'm highlighting different objects. That's the document object model that I'm selecting, different parts of it. Okay, so it's just another word for your HTML, your main HTML document that your JavaScript is manipulating. So when the JavaScript has access to that HTML file, it's having access to what we call the DOM. Before we bring JS into the mix with HTML and CSS, we need to establish some basics of what we can do with it. The next, se uh, next section is going to get us up to speed with some general programming concepts and how they work in JavaScript. So we already know these programming concepts. We'll do our best to ground our examples in real life problems, et cetera, et cetera. We don't need to read this whole thing. But before we go in any further into the lesson about things we already know, 
we do need to go through this website called Node, Node.js. So if you click that link here, I'll attach this link in the chat. Go here and download Node, whether you're on Windows or Mac. Node is going to help us run JavaScript files. So it's a JavaScript file runner. And what you can do with Node is now what we were doing with Trace originally. So I'm going to create a new folder called week one, day five. Uh, example.js. Here in this example, I'll say console.log hello. I'll press play on this one here. And here I have hello. I no longer have to run it through trace to see my code. All I did was install node and I went to its extensions here and then I typed in code runner. I found this extension and now that I installed it, Anytime I'm in a JavaScript file, I can press this play button on the top right and it will run my code. Okay. So go ahead and give me a 10 once you have this fully installed. You no longer have to use trace. And you can if you'd like, but you can use uh, the code runner with Node to run JavaScript on your Visual Studio code. And, and honestly, it's really helpful here. So go ahead and install it. I see four more people need to respond to the survey saying they've installed Node. Okay, three more. Okay, we just need one more person install node. Okay, whoever that last person is, we'll find you. <laughs> uh, or you'll you'll find. I lost me. my survey button. I'm looking for it. Oh, okay. You okay? But you've got it then. It's somewhere, but it's it's installing right now. It's installing. Okay, that's good enough. We'll move forward with the lecture. Okay, just to install that extension code runner. Okay, so here we're going to go over a lot of concepts. I know we already understand, we're already good at, but we're just going to do it for the sake of covering this material to say we did it, and then we'll move on to the more important stuff. So we have variables. Variables are like containers. They contain information. Types of information we can contain in JavaScript are numbers and strings. So if I say var count equals five, this a variable is holding a number, five. This message is holding the string, hello world. This likes.js is holding a Boolean value of true. Booleans can only be true or false. We also have null and undefined. Null is an assigned value. We're saying has an, an empty value. Undefined is when you ask it, what's your value? And it has nothing to say at all. It does, it's never been assigned a value. Okay. We also have var count equals five and count equals a string. We can change variables. We can change their values. In this case, we change it from a number to a string. We also have operators. The one equal sign assigns a value. So here we see var count equals five. So we're giving five to our count with that one equal sign. We can do math, right? We can say var product equals this number plus this number, 
and product will be the total sum of those two numbers. We can say var name equals Marissa, message equals this. JS is actually the trickiest language. So then when we console log, we can say name plus this string, space says space quotes plus message. Then we can put that all together in one string and it will say Marissa says JS is actually the trickiest language. Okay, it's not, but this is what the console log would be if you combine variables with the string. We know how to do this, right? So let me just get another status check to make sure that we know how to do all the things I'm going over here briefly on JavaScript. We know how variables work. We know what they do. We know how to console log them. Um, we can mix them up, right? We can say var name equals fill, var lucky number equals eight, console log name plus uh, string luck, uh, S's or apostrophes lucky number is, and then we can add the lucky number. Fill's lucky number is eight. When we add numbers and strings together, they result in a new string. One more tricky example. Console log, the number is 12 plus three. Console log 12 plus three is a different number. The difference between this is that we're adding to a string. The number is, we're adding 12 to the string. Then we add, then we add three to the string where we added 12 and it will be 123. But if we start with the numbers here, then it will do addition first then add this phrase to the string. 12 plus three is 15. And then it will say, oh, you want me to add to this to that number, this string. Okay, so 15 is a different number. So we can see how we've done math on the second one, but on the first one, we're just concatenating to a string, okay? Let's, let's take a poll on how well we understand this as well. I'll slow down if I feel like there's something here that has not been understood. Oh, okay, so we're getting mixed feedback on this one. All right, so let's let's establish this rule. All that we're seeing here is when we see console log, in the console log, if the first thing we see, counting from left to right, if reading from left to right, if the first thing we see is a string, and we see then plus a number, we're adding to that string. So it will say first, the number is one, two, 12. And then it will add again to that string, the number three. So it will be, the number is one, two, three, 123. Here's adding the value together because it originally starts with a number. When you first start with the number and then you say add to this number, it just thinks, okay, I guess I'm just doing math. There's no string involved yet. But at the very end, we add a string. You say, okay, actually there is a string. So then the string adds to this number, uh, the cat concatenation. What happens then? What do you guys think would happen in this case if I say, What's it going to console log here? Anyone have a clue? It's going to say 15. 15. Oh, go ahead. OK, somebody. 15. 15 is a different number. And then 15, but at the end of it, it's going to have it without the space. And in the beginning, it has space in between it. OK, let's see. I just added a space, but what it says is 15 is a different number, one, two, three. As soon as it recognized, oh, okay, we're actually converting this to a string, it stopped doing math at the very end 
and it just started adding numbers to the end of the string, treating these numbers as if they were words. Okay, so if we start with numbers, it'll start doing math. If we add a string, it'll treat it all as one string. And whatever numbers we add to the very end, it's just concatenated on as if it's a string. Do we see how we did that? 15 is a different number, one, two, three. Let's take a status check on this as well. So it started with math, but as soon as we added a string, after that, everything got treated as words. So then we started adding on 12 to three, and we got 123. Okay, so we have the plus operator, the minus, multiplication, division. Okay, I know we know how to do this, so I don't want to overdo it. Order of operations matter. We know that we know how to do this. Multiplication gets handled first. Four times 10, 40 plus two, 42. Total 10, total plus equals five. So when we say plus equals, divide equals, multiply equals, we're, we're adding on to that number, the number we see on the right. So plus equals five, total is gonna be 15. Okay, if we say plus equals and then a string, we're concatenating to that string. So in this case, we have hello message plus equals world message is now hello world. That's how we add to a string. We know how to do this. We're just now doing it by plus equals. Okay, so then we have different types of data as well. We have numbers, we have strings, we have Boolean values, we have objects. We haven't introduced or, or done much with the object yet. We have arrays. We know what arrays are. Um, so let's go ahead and continue. Let's do a quick quiz here. Okay, what should this console log? Var z equals three times two plus one. Just to get a quick quiz out of the way here. Seven, var z equals three times two plus one. Okay, good. Z equals three times two minus one. So what's Z? Okay. Bar X equals two, var Y equals X times X times X. So what is Y? Okay. Two times two is four, two times four is, what's this last one here? X equals two, var y equals x times x times x. Did I not select the answer? Two times two times two. Asking for console log x, not y. Ah, okay. Almost got me there. Okay, and all of these are correct. So good job, guys. I almost got tricked by that last one. Um, all right, so now conditionals. We know how to look at conditionals. We have true and false. That's a Boolean value. Either it's true or it's false, off or on. So var number equals five, console log number, if it's less than three. This will be 
this will come out as false. So let's go ahead and console log this. False. Because number is not less than three. If you console log a false statement, it will add, it will print false. We also have these operators equal to, not equal to, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to. Okay, double equal sign means a question. It's asking, is A equal to B? Exclamation mark equal sign is saying, is A not equal to B? If A is not equal to B, then less than we know starts with the pointy end on the left and greater than is the open end on the left. And then with the equal sign, it's saying less than or equal to. So it's checking two things at once if it's less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. Then we have conditionals. Var is sunny equals false. Var is rainy equals true. We have this if statement. If is sunny, console log wear sunscreen. If is raining, console log bring an umbrella. That's pretty simple. We know how if statements work. We have so, this one. Uh, oh, go ahead. So if statements uh, always assume that that parameter is true. Yes. If that if what's in the parameter is true, then it will do what's on the inside. If it's true. So if you just write like this, is sunny, it's going to assume it is sunny is equal to true. But okay. since we've said is sunny is false, it's not going to log this. What about a while statement? Yeah, same thing. Okay. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. When you have the variable just like that existing in an if or a while statement, it's asking if whatever's in there is equivalent to true. Now we have here, if is sunny is equal to true, also wear a hat. So that is what this is checking. If is sunny, it's asking if is sunny is equal to true. Okay, let's get a let's get a poll to make sure we understand that just single variable by itself is asking is it equal to true? Do we understand this concept? Okay, lastly, we have else and else if statements. So else checks every other condition that the if didn't check if the if statement did not pass. If the if failed, else checks every other condition. The difference between that and else if is an else if statement checks a specific condition if the if statement did not pass. So in this case, var today equals new date. If today dot get day is equal to one, console log I hate Mondays. Okay. If it's not equal to one, console log today is all right. That same statement can be written this way. If uh, today dot get today is equal to one console log I hate Mondays. Else, if it's not equal to one in every other situation that it's it's not equal to one, we can just shortcut it instead of saying if and saying this instead of this if we just say else console log today is all right. This will do the exact same thing this does, 
except you write less now. You just say else. The else part of the code will run whenever the current day isn't Monday. And the difference also between these two is that this will only run if this is false. This will only run logically if this is false, but set up by the by the function itself, it, there's nothing technically the, that says it won't check this, even if it checks this and this is true. If this is true though, however, this if statement is true, it won't even check this else. It won't, it won't check any unnecessary logic. So the else helps cut down the, the amount of work the computer has to do because it automatically knows if this is gonna be true, then this doesn't have to run. However, if this is false, then, then we check this. In this situation, we have two if statements, both are gonna check no matter what. They're gonna do some checking, even if logically, if this is true, this shouldn't be. And if that's not true, this should be true. The else part of the code will run whenever the current day isn't Monday, which we can mix in additional cases with an else if. So again, the else if as a specific condition, if the if statement doesn't pass, and then we can write an else after an else if to say, even if this else ifs condition doesn't pass, then we'll check every other condition. So if today dot get day is equal to one, console log I hate Mondays, else if it's specific to five, if it's equal to five, we say console log fri Friday, more like Friday, else console log today is all right. So if it's not Monday or Friday, say just generic statement, but if it's not Monday and it is Friday, I want you to say this specific statement, Friday, more like Friday. Okay, and here we have multiple conditions. If we want to pick a good day to go for a walk, we probably want to find time when it's one, not too cold, and two, not rain. We can nest conditions inside of each other and message inside will only be logged if both conditions are true. So here we have an if statement within an if statement. If temperature is greater than or equal to 50. Okay, temperature is 60, so we can uh, go ahead and enter. And if it's not raining, remember that exclamation mark means not. If it's not raining, and raining is false, then console log, this is a good day to go for a walk. So this will console log. There's two if statements. In order to get to the console log, we have to go through the first layer, then the second layer. The way we can avoid this is by saying, check both at the same time in the same if statement. If temperature is less than or equal to 50 and it is not raining. So this and double and sign means that both the left and the right have to be true in order for this to enter the do something section. So both have to be true on the left and right of the double ampersand. This is called an and gate, okay? Both have to be true in order for the gate to open. So we have an AND gate and we have an OR gate. This OR gate, this double, this double line here, just checks that if at least one is true or the left or the right. Sorry, going, going back to that example. Yes. You're on. Uh-huh. So you have the double end and then you have the exclamation mark? Yes. So is that saying is raining is false? Yes. What if it's that? not, if it, if not is raining. So it's, it's asking if it was without the exclamation mark, what would it be asking? If it's true, right? Remember how we went over that up here? We wanted to determine. Yeah, but up is, until now, we've learned that not is like an exclamation mark 
and the equal sign, but that one's just an exclamation mark. Yes, now we can also write exclamation marks in front of variables to check if they are true or false values. So if we were to have without an exclamation mark, see I'm blocking it now, without an exclamation mark, if we read this statement, if temperature is greater than or equal to 50 and is raining, it's asking if is raining is true. Is it true? So a variable by itself, we're asking if that variable is true. In this case, it has a not. So we're asking, is it, and it's false. So I don't always have to put the equal sign and the exclamation mark. So the other way to write this, no, you don't, because the other way to write this is to say, if temperature is greater than or equal to 50, and is raining, it is equal to false. That's another way of writing this. Or we can say, if raining is not equal to true. See how this is written? It's asking the same thing as this. So not is raining means not raining. Is not raining same equal, is at the same value as is raining equal false? Yes. So it's good that we start to learn how these operators, especially the not, the not comes in very handy to ask whether something is true or not, especially in an if statement. Okay, let's do, let's, let's get some feedback on this one. Actually, it's good that we're going over this. I thought that we wouldn't have to, but I think there's some stuff here that we didn't cover in programming basics, such as this syntax here. So here we're asking if is raining is false, not is raining means it's not true. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me, I get hiccups. Okay, so we have this or as well double this double line is asking if either statement on each side of the line is true so here we have temperature is greater than or equal to 50 and i'll change this to an or so what are we going to what are we going to see now if I console log this, what's going to be the result? Is it going to con if is it going to run and and hit this console log? Yes. Okay. Why? Because the first statement is true. Because the first statement is true. Temperature is greater than or equal to fifty. So, temperature is sixty. So, what if we say? If temperature is exactly equal to 50, or if not is raining. What about now? Is this going to trigger? Yes. Why? Because it's going to, it's not raining. Right. Because raining is false, not is raining. So with this double line, if at least one on the left or the right side of it, is true, then it will enter the do something section. So the one on the right side is true. So we say this is a good day to go for a walk still. Okay. What if we take away this exclamation mark? Now, what's going to happen? Nothing. Okay. We console log nothing because nothing in this if statement triggered. 
only in the else here. Because this, none of these were true. None of these triggered uh, temperature was not equal to 50 and rain, is raining was true. So both were false on each side of the or, or gate. So it didn't console log. It skipped this out if went to the else console log nothing. Okay. I think we all understand this concept. But the OR gate is very useful as well. The AND gate and the OR gate are something you want to keep in mind, even if we don't use it right away. Okay, very important tools, AND gate and the OR gate. Now we also have the modulo operator. The modulo operator checks if the remainder of something, it checks for the remainder of something after dividing into it. So five divided by two, would be two with the remainder of one. So two goes into five twice, and there's one remainder. So we're checking if we're asking here, is the remainder zero? If we were to console log this, it would be false because the remainder would be one, not zero. In this case, we have 500 modulo two, two would go into 500 evenly with no remainder equal to zero, no remainder. So then we get a true out of this console log. Is 500 even? That's gonna come out to be true. So we can check to see if something is odd or even by this modulo symbol. We can apply it to other values. If we wanted to see a number is divisible by three evenly, we can use the same approach. We can find uh, an even or odd numbers, Just swap it out for three. So if 78 modulo three is equal to zero, then we know that 78 divided by three without any remainder. If that statement is true, then we, we console log it. When we console log it, we would get a true. Okay. Now, for those of you that are so far bored with today's lesson, everything is is um, just repeat information. I want you guys to go through these articles, okay? There's a difference between a triple equal sign and a double equal sign. And the difference in knowing that is knowing between the, the difference between a truthy and a falsy statement. So now there's not just true and false statements, there's truthy and falsy statements. So um, they, these statements are true like, they are true like, whereas falsy statements are like unidentified, null, zero, an empty string. So knowing the difference between this truthy type of statement and a falsy statement will help you understand the difference between a double equal sign and a triple equal sign. Okay, let's do a quick example of it. So bar A equals um, an empty string var b equals zero. If a is equal to b console dot log. Uh, double equal. And here we got it to console log double equals. See how A is an empty string and B is zero. They're both false like statements. Okay. 
both false like statements. This is not something you have to know for your test, by the way. And this is just extra JavaScript information at this point. Okay, this is an empty string. This is zero. Now we're checking if A is equal to B. And in this if statement with the double equal sign, it was true so that it consoled double equals, okay? That I could have console logged anything here. But what I wanted to prove is that this would trigger this as a true statement. As far as the double equal sign is concerned, an empty string is the same as a zero, but now if I put a triple equal sign and I run and I'll say instead, else triple equals console log. We got the triple equals. triple equals triggered our, our else statement. So this ring as a false, this if statement did not ring as a true. And that's because according to the triple equals, zero is zero and empty quotes is an empty quotes. There is no similar falsey or truthy equivalence. It's like, it's hardcore. It's either you're, you say exactly, you are the value of exactly what you say you are or you're not. Double equals is a little bit more loose. It will say, essentially, a zero in quotes. Let's check to see what triggers here. Okay. Is this going to trigger double equals or triple equals? What are you guys' predictions? Double because it's not going to hit the else statement. Okay. Yeah, so according to a double equal sign, a zero in quotations is essentially the same as a zero without it. Even though one's a string and one's a number, double equal sign looks at the heart of it saying, okay, I see, even though you're a string, the only value in you is a zero, so actually you're a zero. And so you're the same as this number that's a zero. So I'm gonna say, yeah, A and B is equal to each other. If I'm a double equal sign, I'm going to just judge this as pretty much equal because they're both same in value, according to double equal. Triple equal sign, either your string, you have to you have to match the type as well. You can't just match the value inside the string with a number. So triple equal sign will not, this will not be true for a, double, a triple equal sign. So that then we console log this. Okay, I'm just introducing this topic. I'm not really explaining it in detail because then we would go into a tangent about truthy and falsy values. But you, I just want to see, do you guys get the general gist of, between the difference of double equals and triple equals here? Okay, so you'll have to do some reading on your own figure out what truthy values are and falsy values. So I'll link this as well in the chat. So this one is for truthy. This one is for falsy. And this one is for the equality comparison. Okay. So we have loops as well. We know how to do loops. We've learned about while loops today. We have a for loop where we say i equals zero. Well, i equals zero and i is less than three, increase i. Console log i every time. I know we know how to do this. We, we test this on you guys. Here, we just start from 10 and we say, well, i is greater than zero, i minus minus. So we're decreasing i. Here, we're starting i from 12 while saying, while it's greater than three, subtract i by two, i minus equals two. Here we're saying, 
i equals 0.25, while i is less than 3, increase i by 0.5. So we'll print 0 0.25, 0 0.75, 0 0.125, 0 0.175, 0 0.225, 0 0.275. Here we have types of loops for var i equals zero while i is less than three, i plus plus. Then we have var i equals zero while i is less than three, console log i, i plus plus. Okay, another way to think of while loop is a bit like an if that keeps running if until the condition becomes false. It's like an if that keeps running until that condition becomes false. So start 0 and 10 while start is less than 10. We did this this morning. So this is the while loop again. And so we would have this 0 and 10, 1 and 9, start 2 and 8 until we get 5 and 5. Because then at that point, after that, start is no longer less than or equal to end. Okay, if you accidentally make an infinite loop, that means that loop will co continue to check. It will always be true. And then your computer will just keep running faster and faster, trying to make this loop run. And then you'll notice the fans will turn on and your computer might get hot if you leave it on too long. An infinite loop will cause the, the program to run in. Uh, indefinitely or until the system runs out of a resource like memory. When writing loops, for loops and especially while loops, we need to make sure that there is some sort of condition that will lead the loop uh, to the ending of the loop. If we get the logic wrong or if the goal stays out of reach, we can run into an infinite loop. Not every problem needs a loop to solve it. So learning when we need to do them is something that comes with time and practice. Okay, so we'll definitely get that practice in. And let's go ahead and do one more quiz here. Okay, what will be, I know this is a little dark, but I'll try to highlight it. Um, what will be the console log in each of the code examples? So console log eight modulo three. What will eight modulo three console log? Okay, Con console log eight modulo three equals to two. Is that going to be true, false, or undefined? Okay, we got it true. For var i equals 8, while i is greater than or equal to, should be greater than or equal to, ignore the minus sign. While i is greater than or equal to 2, i minus equals 3. console log i. What are we going to get? Are we going to get this one here? Yes. Because it's checking while i is greater than negative 2. If this were the answer, this wouldn't qualify because we get past negative 2 here. We get to negative 4. Okay, x equals zero, var i equals one, while i is less than five, increase i. Then we say x plus equals i. So with console log x at the end, what's the final value of x? You can tell me. So x is zero, 
And then we say var i equals one. I starts at one while i is less than five. So when i is one, we say x plus equals i. Zero plus equals one. So what's gonna be the answer? Two, Mike says. Last one, var x equals zero, var i equals one, while i is less than five, x plus equals i, console log x. I thought we just did this. It's a string this time. Oh, it's a string this time. Ah, okay. So, good catch. And here we are. Without it adding to a string, the answer would have been 10 with the string 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so then we have a couple assignments we need to work on. FizzBuzz, this assignment for each number that's a multiple of three, print Fizz. For each number that's a multiple of five, print Buzz. For numbers that are multiple of three and five, print fizz buzz. This can be a, a an interview question for a job. Print fizz, make this fizz buzz one work. So we know we would need the modulo symbol for this, right? To get this to print one, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz, seven, eight, fizz, buzz. Checking multiples of three, five and both three and five. If it's both three and five, 15, for example, here, we get fizz buzz. Uh, there's some practice we can use with the debugger. It's not essential that we know how to use this yet. Don't worry if we don't figure this out. And loop challenges. We want to create these loops to print odds from 1 to 20, decreasing multiples of 3 from 100, printing a sequence for 2.5, 1. So find what will create this sequence here in console log these values. Sigma, which means that we write code that will add the values from 1 to 100 onto some variable sum, and at the end, console log the result, 1 plus 2 plus 3, we should get back 50-50 at the end. And lastly, factorial. Write code that will multiply all the values from 0 to 12 on some variable. At the end, console log the result, 1 times 2 times 3, and we should get back this number. 479,000. Um, then 1,600. Okay. Arrays, we know what arrays are. There's uh, primitive values such as numbers, strings, booleans. Arrays take in multiple types of values, separate them by a comma, in these brackets, okay? We know how arrays work. We want to access something at that arrays value. So for example, um, purchase, uh, purchases week Feb 15. If we wanted to, to grab that number that's 1288, how would we access that number? We do it this way. We say purchase, purchases week Feb 15 at index zero. When we look in this, I spelled it wrong. I put purchase, but it's supposed to say purchases. But if I spelled it right, 
I would be doing it the same way, just accessing it at index zero. That would give me that first value, 12.88. Okay. All right. So that ends that. Actually, let's go over functions really quick. We now have functions written. This is a name of a function. We can put stuff in the do something section of the function. And the way we call the function is by saying that function's name with the open and close parentheses. That's the calling or invoking. When the computer's reading a code, it gets to a function. It does not execute it immediately. We want the code to be executed. We'll call it by its name and add an open and close parentheses. So now we have defined our counter function and are calling it so our computer knows to run the code within the function. So here, create a function. It's a for loop inside this function. This is the first call to the function, so it will run the function. This is the second call, so it will run the function again. Parameters are the values that we put at the start of our function that are a placeholder so that when we call our function with that specific number, it gets passed into that parameter. We can use that parameter inside the function however we'd like with that number that we would assume to have given it here. We also have a way to return versus console log. Return gives that value to the function itself. So if we say var y equals create array at five, What is the value of y? It's whatever the return is of this create array. So we give it five. We give it five in the num. It does something with this num. And then it returns a new array. So that new array value is going to be what y equals here. OK, let's do another status check. Do we understand how parameters work? and how when we invoke the function, those parameters receive the values we give it. And if we create a variable out of that function call, then we are and the return would give that variable its value. Okay, so let's get, let me, help me understand how well we understand this. Okay, so then I will introduce one quick little topic here about how, uh, a little bit into Monday's lecture about how JavaScript can interact with um, HTML. Okay, I'm going to delete this one here. I'm going to delete everything in this example. I'm going to recall this script.js. And I'm also going to create a file here called index.html. Index Okay, I'll do exclamation mark, enter. In this exclamation mark, enter, I'm gonna create a link to my script.js. So I'm gonna say link, or if I just type in script, script, and then SRC. Now I'm gonna link my script.js, so I say script.js. As long as I'm, this HTML file is in the same folder location as the JavaScript file, if I include this line, uh, script src equals script.js, 
I am now linking the JavaScript file to the HTML. The way I will check this, so let's let's work with the JavaScript on the right now, is I want to console log something. I'm just going to say hello world. So I'm going to put also an H1 tag that says hello world. So when we open this, okay, here's our hello world on the left. If I right click, click inspect and go to the console here, let's refresh this. It's supposed to console log. Hello, how come it's not doing it? Maybe I spelled something wrong. Script. I do dot slash. Okay. Now it should be linked. So now, as soon as we open our console, we see that console log there. Hello from this. Now we can see console logs in this area. When we right click, click inspect, go to the console. Now we can see whatever we print. So we can say, hello, class. There it is. As soon as the page loads, it'll load the script tag. You can you can also run a JavaScript on your page just by itself without linking a file here. You can run some script. Yeah, I, I think you went a little too fast. So you use live, the live window for HTML and then the, the... Yes. No, so this is just our HTML. This is what we're used to seeing, right? A, this is an H1 that says hello world. So we're used to seeing this now. So why, now, is it not running, why can't you see hello on this from JavaScript? From JavaScript? So I'm just doing introducing one thing at a time. Okay. Uh, okay. I can do that. But the, the first thing I want to show is that now this HTML file has a JavaScript file attached to it. And with that JavaScript file, we can print stuff to the console. This is our special screen area just for us developers. Normally a, a user on a website wouldn't right click and go to the console to see this, right? right? And have you ever done that before, before you were a developer? Probably not. But now we can see here in this special screen area, the console, we can console log stuff and we can see it in this area. And when we see it in this area, that's how we know we've properly linked our JavaScript file to our HTML. When we include, when we include this script tag at the bottom of the body of our HTML, then we can link something. Okay, let's do one more demo here. And then we'll save this for Monday's lecture. Okay, so I want to create a function in my JavaScript. And this function, it's going to console log this message is coming from script.js. So I'm going to delete my console log, paste this function. Now, we know that with JavaScript, a function by itself, even though it's defined, it's not going to be called until we invoke that function. Until we call that function specifically, there's nothing that's going to make this run. So if I go here and I refresh, I inspect my page, I go to the console, there's nothing in the console here because this is limited by this function's call. Remember, this function has to be called in order for it to, to actually run this console log. 
Okay, so what can we do then in our HTML that will go ahead and call this function? What we'll do here is on this H, instead of this H1 here, we'll make, we have this button. It says, click me. So let's see this button. Click me. Right now, if we click it, it doesn't do anything. But if in this section here, we say on click, on click in this here now, we can, just as we would invoke the function here. Okay, let's invoke the function. So we'll say custom open quotes, close, uh, open parentheses, close parentheses. So now as soon as we run the page, it'll run this, right? Because as soon as it loads this whole entire JavaScript, it reads it from top to bottom. It reads at line seven. Oh, you want me to call this function? So I'll console log it. So when we get to our page, as soon as we see our page, we can see this in the console log in the message already in the console here. So now what we wanna do is not make it so that it runs it automatically when it reads the page. We're gonna cut this from this area and paste it on this on click. So earlier in programming basics, we would ask the question, why do we need to wrap it in this function? Why don't we just console log straight off the bat? You know, why do we need to wrap anything in a function at all? Here's why because when we wrap it in a function, we limit it to its invocation. Now the invocation is gonna be only on the click of this button. So now when I click this button, I am invoking the function. I'm, I'm saying, do this. Here's the start button. I've linked it to an actual button now. So if I click, click me, I'll see this message is coming from script.js only on the click. You see that? I refresh the page. If I click it again, it'll say, okay, we've run this message twice now. There's a two. I can click it as many times as I need and it will run that function as many times as I click now. Okay, what if I have like, for example, a variable here, variable number equals zero. And instead of this console log, I say, I want every time you run this function, add to num and then console log num. So now I have a, a button here that when I click it, it will console log num after it's added to it. So num starts at zero. When I click the button, we see a one. When I click the button again now, we see a two, all right? And we'll keep seeing an increase of numbers because now the function call is triggered by it being on this on click in the button. Okay, so let's get some feedback, how well we're understanding now function calls being limited to button clicks. Okay, this is gonna come with practice. So what you guys need to do today is get through today's lessons uh, material. So it's loop challenges and fizz buzz. You guys may still be working on the profile page, so finish that up as soon as possible, then get onto today's JavaScript, loop challenges and fizz buzz. These are practice assignments. Once you do that, then go on to Monday morning's reading, okay? Monday morning's reading is super important and it's so dense and it's only a couple days before the test on Wednesday. So the, the reading, See here, this whole event, this whole section, 
document object model is the whole section before the yellow belt. This is the exam. So this now is gonna be in addition to what we've learned using CSS and HTML. Okay, once we create the profile page, we, we've hit a threshold of our level in CSS. Okay, once you get to that, now we wanna be able to incorporate JavaScript and manipulate the page using JavaScript. So all of this information is gonna be super relevant, super helpful. They've saved the best for last, okay? So go through this document object model section carefully. You're gonna to need to have three JavaScript features on your website that you build for the test. So you're gonna to have to have at least three and there's more than three that we teach you here. So you need to know how to link JavaScript to your page and how to make these different features. Everything that we would test you on on the test is on these assignments. So for example, if we go through this assignment, likes, what this is, is a page that when you click a like button, it will increase the likes by that much. I haven't showed you how to change something on the HTML on the DOM using JavaScript, but that'll be something we do on Monday. Okay, this afternoon, we're gonna do some trivia party. It's gonna be light day. I know we had a heavy week doing a lot of HTML and CSS, lots of learning that we had to do. So this afternoon, we're just gonna do a simple trivia party. And then we have our code reviews that we do after that. So everyone that's gonna do a code review today will need to have signed up and go to the code review section here. So at three, we have this group that's full. If anyone else wants to sign up for the 4 p.m. session, they'll start to have to add their name there. I think with this here is six, it's 11. So we're missing a few people here already. So we have to do some type, type of code review between now, today, and the day of the test, which is Wednesday. So you have to sign up. I think there's a couple more people that are missing here that haven't signed up. Okay, so go ahead and do that. And uh, do we have any questions today? Not too hard today, right? Just JavaScript stuff we already knew? Yeah, how would we feel if we didn't take programming basics? This would be a heavy lesson, right? Would have would have introduced everything at once. So that's how it was when I was a student, and I didn't get anything at all about JavaScript. It just went completely over my head. Didn't understand a thing. So I'm glad I get to help you guys understand something that no one really, I couldn't really have the time to understand on my own. So okay. All right, let's go ahead and end the lesson, create the breakout rooms, and uh, I'll be hopping around rooms to see how you guys are doing. Make sure you guys are making progress.